thank you very, very much. I hope you can all hear me in the back. Now, a few preliminary remarks. Little did I know that one of the presenters, my friend Peter here, comes from the golden land of Brooklyn. <laughs> we used to play Sheep's Head High School in my youth. And we used to refer to Sheep's Head Bay as, ready for this? A matzo pizza neighborhood. <laughs> That's what we used to say. Now, one other preliminary remark. No guilt should be felt by anyone, really, regardless of religion. You were not there. Again, you have no responsibility. Uh, Amber, let me say to you, the Lutheran Church quite correctly says, indeed, in Germany, did not carry itself with glory. But the one country in all of Europe that saved its Jewish population was Denmark, which is 99% Lutheran. 91% of the Lutheran clergy in Denmark were in the underground and helped save the Jews. So one has to be very careful about making blanket statements. One last preliminary remark. Look at me well. I am not the prophet from Union College. <laughs> I do not have a monopoly on the truth. And history is not mathematics. You cannot say A plus B produces C. You cannot do it. History is a matter of interpretation. When I speak to you, I am giving you, of course, my interpretation based upon voluminous reading and conversations and experiences. But this is not chemistry. It is not physics. You should never suspend your common sense. In the end, you are the arbiters of what is right and what is wrong. Now, it is 68 years since the end of the Holocaust, since the end of the Second World War. There are things that we know now that we didn't know then. There are things that we knew all along, but we didn't like to say. But now, 68 years later, and after, let us say, somewhat analogous genocides, and living in the dangerous time in which we do, I use the old Yiddish expression, it is time to talk talkless. It is time to talk substance about the causes and the evolution of the Holocaust. It is very difficult to say why something begins. Suffice it to say that the Jews were largely, primarily, the only non-Christian group living in Europe in the medieval period and what used to be called the Dark Ages. The abhorrence for the Jew as someone as being different, the idea of the Jew as Christ killer, these were things that would bedevil the Jews. And in fact, I use the term bedevil, I think, cautiously, but not inappropriately. Because the fact of the matter is, in the medieval period, the Jews would be linked with the devil. That's why in some places, Jews were forced to wear yellow hats. Yellow is the sign of the devil. The devil always came with sulfur. When you burn sulfur, it turned yellow. So in short, there was, again, a dehumanization and a demonization of the Jewish community. Forgive me, I don't want to bore you with the history. Suffice it, we'll put it this way. Condemned religiously as a pariah group, as a pariah race, as a pariah nation, the Jews were limited in what they could do economically, which forced them into certain occupations that people found obnoxious. Not allowed to own land, not allowed to participate in crafts in cities and towns, the Jews survived as they always do, by fitting into the nooks and crannies of every society in which they're in. They do the things that the majority populations either do not want to do or cannot do. In medieval Europe, this was the lending of money at interest. Jews, many of them, were money lenders. You don't have to be a, a wizard of economics or a wizard of psychology to understand 
that this would not ingratiate the Jews to the indigenous populations. As we all know, interest rates are a function of risk. The higher the risk, the greater the interest rate. In the medieval period, the risks were great. Bandits on the roads, pirates on the seas, instability politically everywhere. Interest rates sometimes were 180% per annum. One doesn't have to be a wizard of economics to understand that some people will borrow money from the Jews, will never be able to pay it back, and will not be filled, therefore, with love and admiration for the Jews. What also took place, again, through dehumanization and demonization, was the development of a folklore. The Jews have tails. The Jews have horns. To an American audience, this should not be strange. After all, and I say this with burning sorrow, look what we Americans have done over the centuries to the African American community. We dehumanized them. We demonized them. We said their physiology was different. Their moral capacities, their intellectual capacities were different. It was all nonsense. But that folklore would become part and parcel of American society, and unfortunately, in some quarters, it remains. Not even the coming of modernity is going to affect the course of anti-Semitism. In some ways, it will in a positive way. The coming of the Enlightenment, what we all studied in high school and college, Voltaire, Diderot, Montesquieu, all of these men, in one way or another, spoke about the equality of human beings and opened up new, new opportunities for the Jews. And what was done intellectually was done politically by the French Revolution. It is the revolution and the spread of the revolution to the rest of Europe that in fact opens up tremendous options for the Jews. But there was a lag. That is, the law said new things about the Jews, emancipating the Jews. But the old ideas about the Jews as aliens, as pariahs, as Christ killers, these ideas continued to exist. And there was something else. When the ghetto walls came tumbling down, when the Jews were emancipated and made free with everyone else, when the universities were open, the Jews were like a coiled spring, pressed down for so many years. Like a coiled spring, they rose to the top very, very quickly. I don't mean to bore you with the figures. Listen to some of these figures. They are astounding. This is not a lecture in Jewish chauvinism. It is simply to make a point. And that is, for example, take the largest German state of Prussia, where the Jews were a relatively insignificant minority. Out of every 300, let us say, out of every 100,000 Protestants, maybe 58 in the universities, out of every 100,000 Catholics, 33. Out of every 100,000 Jews, 518. The Jews are not smarter than anybody else. It is history, to a certain degree, culture, that has made them that. And the same thing would hold true in other European countries as well. The 18th and 19th centuries would see the triumph of liberalism and capitalism. Liberalism would open up tremendous opportunities for the Jews. After all, what did liberalism say? The only thing that counts is your ability. There should be a separation between church and state. The relationship between a human being and God, that was not the province of the state. It was an individual, private relationship. The state did not have the right to intervene. And capitalism? Capitalism opened opportunities for all sorts of people. But the people who had some learning, the people who were in the urban areas, they were the primary beneficiaries. And so what is going to take place? It's almost counterintuitive. The Enlightenment and the French Revolution and Emancipation should have opened up opportunities for the Jews and should have eliminated anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism was considered by some people to be a vestige of the medieval period. But that was not so. Not only was there a gap between the new laws of emancipation and the way the old habits of thought were, but now the Jews constituted something that they had never constituted before. They were competition in the universities, competition in the professions, competition virtually everywhere. The result would be, counterintuitively, 
an exacerbation of the anti-Semitic impulse. And then there was something else. Science is supposed to enlighten us, and it does. We are what we are because of modern science. But the problem was, for those of you that remember your high school and college history, see, now you're so lucky that you're not my students at Union. <laughs> because if you were my students at Union, I would walk right down there, right where she is sitting, and I would turn to a student and say, what was the outstanding scientific development of the 19th century that shaped the way people thought? Now, I will tell you, I really shouldn't tell you this. This will lighten up a slumber subject. I shouldn't tell you this. But I have learned, this is my 47th year of teaching at Union College. And I have learned something that they do not teach in education departments or in pedagogical institutes. There is nothing like a little bit of intimidation to get a 30-point rise in the IQ. It lasts 20 seconds. That's all it lasts. But sometimes you can get a lot in 20 seconds. And the answer, of course, to that question is, that question of what was the most important scientific development, is, of course, Darwin's theory of evolution. There is nothing anti-Semitic in Darwinism. Nothing anti-Semitic. But what's going to take place in the third and fourth quarters of the 19th century is an intellectual marriage between the anti-Semites or the anti-Jews and the so-called social Darwinists. Didn't operate all the time, but it was there. For the social Darwinists, not Darwin, but those who said you could apply his theory of evolution to human beings, they said if there are inferior species and superior species among animals, and we are, we human beings, are the highest form of animal life, then there must be inferior species and superior species among human beings. Hence the concept of race. Hence the concept of the idea of the Jews as an insidious race, as a destructive race. Racism is going to change everything. Everything. Again, I know to whom I am speaking. There are certain things that have to be said. For 1900 years, some people, some people might say, you see that Jewish kid crossing the street? Let's beat the living daylights out of him because his ancestors killed Jesus and his people reject the true Christian faith. That's for 1900 years. But with the development of the new racism of the second half of the 19th century, the argument will be, see that Jewish boy crossing the street? There's no sense in roughing him up. There's no sense in converting him. Because the evil of the Jew is not in his Talmud. It is not in his Torah. It's in his blood. It's in his, later what people would say, it's in his genes and his chromosomes. You don't have to be a wizard of logic to come to understand that if the Jew's evil is contained in his blood, no amount of conversion, no amount of education will change him. So that too is a problem. And then there is something else. Something again that has to be talked about frankly. And that is, by the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, a number of Jews, a very, very small number of Jews, <laughs> confronting lingering anti-Semitism and confronting violence, particularly in the eastern part of the continent, the word pogrom is a Russian word. It literally means a riot, a mutiny. But because it was aimed, there were so many attacks upon Jews, beginning in 1881 and 1882, well into the 20th century before World War I, the term pogrom became synonymous with an attack upon Jews. So a small number of Jews began to attach themselves to left-wing political movements, particularly to the socialist and communist parties. And the chief rabbi of Moscow put it very, very well in a famous statement. He said, quote, the Trotskys play the tune, but the Brunsteins pay the piper. Leon Trotsky's real name was Brunstein. Trotsky was a pseudonym, like Lenin was a pseudonym. Lenin's real name was Ulyanov. 
So the argument is going to be, it's the Jews who are the communists, the Jews who are the revolutionaries. And what was the old Russian expression? It has an analog in German too. Those under pressure in Russia and in Germany, usually people of the far right, people of wealth, people of privilege, people of noble status. They wanted to deflect the animosity from the populations away from them onto someone else. So in German the expression was, die Juden sind unser Unglück. The Jews are our misfortune. Why are you poor? The Jews did that. Why did we lose the war? The Jews stabbed us in the back. In Russian the expression is, Beji dog spasaito seal. Beat the kikes and save Russia. An attempt by the Russian government to attribute all revolutionary sentiment in Russia to the Jews. It of course was not true. The overwhelming, the vast proportion, the vast majority of Jews were neither communists nor socialists. They were either men and women of the center or they were caught up in religious enthusiasm and therefore would have nothing to do with either socialism or communism. <coughs> but all of this is prehistory. When does it really change? After all, for all of the anti-Semitism in Germany, and given the fact that we know what happens that will come out of Germany in the 20th century, from 1819 to 1933, there was no physical attacks upon Jews in Germany, with a handful of exceptions in 1848. And for all of the anti-Semitism in Germany after 1867 and after 1871 when Germany was created, there was no reversal of emancipation. When a ferocious anti-Semite got up in the German parliament in the 1890s and said, I have found a way to solve the Jewish question. And the way that we solve it is to castrate all Jewish males and to throw all Jewish women into brothels. He was laughed out of the parliament, even by the anti-Semitic political parties. So how do you explain that less than 40 years later, policies like that will be created? Here we get down to the nitty gritty. Virtually every historian of the Holocaust and of the Third Reich has made the point, and I think the correct point, that World War I changed everything. World War I was the seminal event of the 20th century. For our purposes, for our purposes, in this particular talk, Germany's loss in the war, the beginning of the losses, 1916-1917, saw many Germans seek or look for, an, for a scapegoat. And so the argument was, there was a call in Germany, believe it or not, for what in German was called a Juden census. That is, the argument was, the Jews are sitting out the war. They're making money at home. They're making time with our women and our girls. So let's say take a census and see how many Jews are really serving the right. The census is taken. The census is never revealed during the war. Because to the astonishment of the anti-Semites in the German high command, who were convinced that the Jews were sitting out the war, something startling was revealed. There were a shade more than 500,000 Jews living in Germany out of a total population of 65 million. On a percentage basis, more Jews were serving at the front than was true of Germans. And when it came to those who were killed at the front, on a percentage basis, more Jews were killed at the front than of the indigenous majority German population. The census figures were never revealed until the end of the, not the end of the war, until after the end of the war. But that proverbial genie was out of the bottle. The Jews sat out the war, was the argument. And then Germany would experience trauma after trauma after trauma. If there is a lesson here, be careful. You can't push people too far. You can't push a country too far. Germany's loss in the war, trauma number one. You all learned this in high school and in college. 
it is essentially a correct assessment. It's not the only reason for the Nazi accession to power, but it is a contributing and a major contributing factor. Trauma after trauma. Trauma number one, Germany's loss in the war. Trauma number two, the Treaty of Versailles that treated Germany very harshly. Trauma number three, the terrible inflation of 1923. In 1912, the rate of exchange was four marks to the dollar, four German marks to the dollar. By 1918, eight marks to the dollar. By 1920, 12 marks to the dollar. At the height of the hyper hyperinflation, over a billion marks to the dollar. In that golden land of Brooklyn, where Peter and I went to school, they used to have a textbook in the 50s. And the textbook, the history textbooks, had two very interesting pictures. They may still have them because they're valid pictures. Of a man with a wheelbarrow filled with money going into a grocery store. And then the next picture shows him coming out with a bottle of milk and a loaf of bread. Families who had saved their entire lives would be wiped out. The inflation would eventually come to an end, but there would be a price. And then perhaps the greatest trauma of them all. Again, please listen to the figures. In 1928, one year before the onset of the Great Depression, the Nazi party received 800,000 votes out of about 20 million cast. An insignificant minority party. That's in 1928. In 1930, one year after the Depression began, the Nazis received six and a half million votes out of a shade more than 20 million. And then in July of 1932, they received 37.6% of the popular vote, a clear plurality. <coughs> the Nazis were going to come to power, not via violence, not by revolution, but in fact via the ballot box. For large numbers of Germans, Germany had been pushed too hard, and there had to be an answer. And here we come to a fundamental lesson in history. I tell my students on the first day of every class, what is it that makes history change? Ideas are important. Of course they are important. So is demography. So is technology. So is science. So is coincidence. So is chance. So is disease. But I tell you what I tell them. Never, never, never minimize the role of personality in history. If Hitler is not there, the Nazis do not come to power. If Hitler is not there, there is no Second World War. If Hitler is not there, there is no Holocaust. And here, I must confess, we come to the limits of the historian. I can tell you what Hitler did. I can tell you what he said. I can tell you some of the things, the terrible things, that when he made decisions about invading Russia, I can tell you why he did that. What I cannot tell you, and no psychiatrist and no psychologist, if he or she is honest, can tell you, where did this pathological hatred of the Jews come from? I cannot tell you that. But that is something that we must deal with. He hated the Jews. He saw the Jews as the ultimate evil. He saw the Jews destroying every civilization that had ever existed. He saw the Jews as a threat to Germany. He held the Jews responsible for inflation, depression, and Germany's loss in the war. He spoke about the elimination of Jews from German society. And later, by the end of the 30s and once the war begins, the elimination of Jews from the face of the earth. What we now know, again, we cannot explain that. But what we do know is that by the end of the 1930s, there was a phenomenon known as marching towards the Fuhrer. As one high-ranking Nazi put it, we know what our Fuhrer wants. It is our job to implement it, to march towards him. And by 1939 and 40 and 41, Hitler's rhetoric about the Jews, concerning the Jews, is absolutely ferocious. If before the Second World War, he is saying the Jews did A through Z to us. Once the war begins, Hitler is telling the German people, as I am speaking to you, the Jews are making war against us. 
It's the Jews who control Roosevelt. It's the Jews who control Churchill. It's the Jews who control Stalin. The Jews everywhere are seeking to destroy us. <coughs> and men like Himmler and Hydra and Goring and Hoyce, these are the men that will march towards their fury. These are the men that will build the concentration camps. These are the men that will carry out the murders and order the murders. These are the men who will say in the case of Himmler, and it's an important statement, we must kill them, he says to his SS commanders in the Ukraine. <coughs> we must kill them down to the last child in the cradle. Now I mention that to you because I'm giving, going to give you another quote that you should all remember. Nobody said it or wrote it better than Elie Wiesel. Wiesel said, all of the Jews were victims, but not all of the victims were Jews. Do not think for a single moment that the Jews were the only ones to die. Gypsies died. Gays and lesbians died. Lots of Poles died. Lots of people who were not Jewish died in German-occupied Europe. The difference between Jewish destiny in German-occupied Europe and the destiny of everyone else is that every Jew had to die down to the last child in the cradle. So what do we know? What questions do we ask? It's one thing for a man to say, like Hydra, or like Himmler, the head of the SS, the Jews have got to die, we've got to build concentration camps. We've got to create Einsatzgruppen, mobile killing squads. We all know that. People make statements like that and they give orders. The question is, they're not the ones that do the actual killing. The actually killing is done by ordinary people, not very much different from ourselves. So a question that has really plagued historians and psychiatrists and psychologists and political scientists is how do you explain this? It's not easy to explain. There is no easy answer. The best answer, I think, is the one that concerns itself with the role of ideology. From the time a German child under the Nazis entered elementary school at the kindergarten level, he or she was inculcated with the most ferocious of anti-Semitic ideas. More than the Jews are a misfortune. The Jews rape, the Jews pervert, the Jews steal. The Jews destroyed Germany before. The Jews will destroy Germany again. The Jews are one dimension. They are subhuman types and they must be rooted out. Listen to the statement of an educated man. He was a physician in a killing battalion. That's Battalion 101, the order police. This is an organization composed of policemen from Hamburg. They are not particularly well educated, and they are very few of them are members of the Nazi party. But they're smart enough to know, to answer an ad in a newspaper. The newspaper says, we need policemen in German-occupied Poland. And the policemen understood, better to be a policeman in German-occupied Poland than to be eventually conscripted and sent to fight on the Eastern Front against the Red Army. So they go there. And then they are told, they're told a number of things. They're trained as policemen. And then we have the stenographic account of these men. It's a very interesting account. One day after their training, nighttime, they get up in the morning and they see their commander, their commandant. He's got bloodshot eyes, bloodshot eyes and he's crying. He said, I've been up all night because I got an order Berlin that is so terrible, so bizarre, that I've stayed up all night to confirm the order. The order is, we must go into the nearby town of Yosefka, named for Joseph II. We must go into the nearby town and kill the 1,800 Jewish men, women, and children in that town. And then he said something that we did not know about which is a remarkable thing. 
he turned to the people in his battalion and said, this is such a terrible order, such a terrible order, that if there's anybody here who feels he cannot carry out this order, it's all right. Step out of the line, there will be no punishment. We didn't know that. We thought that these men in analogous battalions were conscripted and forced to do these things. That was not the case. There were a few men that actually stepped out of line and did not participate. When it came to interrogating the others as to why they stayed in line, why they carried out, ultimately this police battalion was responsible for the deaths of almost 90,000 Jews. So why did they stay in line? Well, there's some interesting speculation by Christopher Browning and by other historians. Some of them did it for opportunistic reasons. Germany, they said, is going to win the war. We want good careers when the war is over. We don't want it in our records that when we were asked to carry out an order, we declined to do it. Others did it because of peer pressure. A good soldier, it's a lousy, stinking thing that we have to do. But a good soldier doesn't let his comrades down. And a number of them were inculcated with Nazi ideology. The Jews are the scum of the earth. They will kill our children unless we kill their children. They were people that believed this. And then listen, I come back to the doctor. A doctor, an educated man, not a quack. The battalion had a German physician attached to it. He was to provide for the psychiatric and for the physiological needs, the medical needs. When the war is over, it is discovered that he has done certain things. One of the things that he does is to show the German soldiers in the police battalion where if a Jewish woman is holding a child, where they should shoot the woman so that the bullet goes simultaneously through the child and the woman, so as to economize on time and on ammunition. And so when he is asked after the war, you are a physician, you are trained to save lives, how could you do such a thing? Listen to the answer that the physician gives. I did exactly what I was trained to do. Now I give a parenthesis. What he is about to say is what my doctor friends say is absolutely correct. That is, he goes on to say, I was trained as a battlefield surgeon that if a soldier is wounded in a limb and gangrene sets into the limb and you cannot deal with the gangrene, you amputate the limb in order to save the body. That's good medicine. Second statement, the Jews are the gangrene of society. They must be amputated from society. That's the role of ideology. And what about the Jews? What about their behavior? Jewish historians have forever been perplexed, almost guilty, because a number of Jews, some of whom survived and some of whom did not survive, made a very unfortunate statement. The most famous of those statements is, quote, said in Polish and in Yiddish, but I'll give you the English translation, quote, about the Jews, they went like sheep to the slaughter, end quote. Jewish historians and Jews in general have been perplexed by this issue of what is conceived to be, alleged to be, a lack of Jewish resistance. I'm going to tell you that when you look at the obstacles to resistance, one is astonished not that there was little resistance, there was more than little resistance, but that there was any resistance whatsoever. Let's take the Warsaw Ghetto. We know more about the Warsaw Ghetto because of a secret archive called the Onik Shabbat Archive, literally the Festival of the Sabbath Archive, that was compiled by and run by a very interesting man, Emanuel Ringelblum, who with his wife and child will eventually be killed by the Nazis. Ringelblum commissioned doctors, lawyers, educated social workers to write about life in the ghetto. They bury them in milk cans. When the war is over, some but not all of the milk cans 
are going to be found. They tell us more about the Warsaw Ghetto than about any other ghetto. For those of you that have the long memory, you may remember the first book that was written on the Warsaw Ghetto, John Hersey's book, The Wall. Again, based on those accounts. The most famous book, fictional account of the Warsaw Ghetto, is the book by Leon Uris, Miwa 18, which was the headquarters of the Jewish fighting organization. But virtually every book on the Holocaust dealing with the Warsaw Ghetto relies on the Onik Shabbat archives. So what do we learn? We learn that the amount of food allowed by the Germans into the Warsaw Ghetto on a per capita daily basis was 184 calories per day. You don't have to be a great nutritionist to understand that people living on 184 calories a day, they're going to die in large numbers and they're going to be perpetually weakened. This is not the stuff from which you make revolution. The doctors tell us some other things. Again, when you talk about the Holocaust, you can't beat around the bush. It's an ugly chapter in history. The number of children that were still born skyrockets. The number of women and girls who ceased to menstruate. Enormous numbers. There were even instances, not many, not many, but if they're recorded once, twice, or three times in people's diaries, you know that it happened more than once, twice, or three times. There were even instances of Jewish cannibalism, where the Jews ate their own dead because of the starvation. The Nazi policy of duplicity, only in America, only in America, could you have a program like Hogan's Heroes. But the Germans look like buffoons. Well-intentioned buffoons, they drink too much beer. The fact of the matter is the German war effort was not conducted well. Hitler was a lousy war leader. But the most effective aspect of the German war effort was the war against the Jews. The Germans practiced acts of duplicity. The pearl of the Sephardic diaspora. Sephardic means Jews descended from the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, and Portugal. When they were expelled in 1492, and then in 1497 from Portugal, many Jews went to the Greek city of Salonika, which was part of the Ottoman Empire. There were 55,000 Jews living in Salonika when the Germans took over the city. When the Jews were put on trains bound for Auschwitz, the Jews were not told they were going to Auschwitz. They were handed deeds to land in the Ukraine, telling them that they were now going to be landowners and farmers, productive people. Nearly all of them will be dead in 96 hours. And when the trains arrived in Treblinka, the death factor where the, maybe as many as 950,000 Jews were killed, <coughs> Treblinka is out in the woods, the end of the world. But when the Jews looked through the slats on the trains, they didn't see that. What they saw were clocks. They saw a false railroad station. They saw a ticket master. They also saw signs. Warsaw this way, Lublin this way, Vilna this way. They too will be dead in a short period of time. Nazi duplicity was very effective. So too was the Nazi policy of collective responsibility. If a Jew did anything, attempted to strike a Nazi officer, to kill a Nazi officer. The penalty would be paid by lots and lots of other people. If a Jew escaped from Auschwitz, the Nazis would kill hundreds. Everybody leaves hostages to fortune. We do in our own lives now. It was even greater then. And then, an unfortunate sordid, another sordid aspect of the Holocaust. The war against the Jews was a pan-European phenomenon. There wasn't a country in Europe in which there were not people. There were always people in every country, including Denmark, including Bulgaria, that were prepared to assist the Nazis in murdering the Jews. And the further east you went in Europe, the greater was the degree of collaboration. The Jews very often found themselves alone. Was it religious antipathy? For some. Was it the alleged linkage of the Jews with communism? For some. Was it envy? A desire to get their hands on Jewish property? 
Or was it the desire to, to violate sexually Jewish women and girls? For some people it was there too. The problem confronting the Jews in resistance is that there were very few people that were prepared to help them. And yet, the Warsaw Ghetto Revolt in April and May of 1943 is the first urban revolt against the Nazis. And in the forests and in the woods, there were thousands, tens upon thousands of Jews, either operating in their own partisan units or operating with the Red Army or operating with the Polish units. There were Jews that were fighting against the Nazis. It's a myth, this lack of Jewish resistance. Jewish resistance was there. It is nothing to be ashamed of. If we went to Germany today, and I picked a hundred Germans off the street, and asked them, was Germany responsible for what had taken place? And the answer is, 99 would tell you yes. There's no Holocaust denial in Germany. But there's a myth in Germany. A myth that we now know is really a myth, it is not true. For large numbers of Germans will tell you, yes, Germany was responsible for the death of six million Jews. But the men who did this were not our gallant soldiers in the Wehrmacht, the German army. This was done by the SS, this was done by the party. These are the ones that are guilty. Our gallant soldiers fought gallantly for Germany, valiantly for Germany. Every piece of evidence we have indicates that that is not true. Particularly in the eastern part of Europe, the Wehrmacht, ordinary German soldiers, collaborated with the SS and with the order police in the murder of Jews. <coughs> and then there is something else. There's a, there's a myth that is held by many Jews. Why did we die? Did everybody hate us? And the answer so many Jews will say, yes, the whole world hated the Jews. That's not so. It was not so. The whole world did not hate the Jews. The problem confronting the Jews was a fundamental asymmetry. In this form, if God forbid, the spirit of Adolf Hitler walked through that door, and I said, Herr Hitler, the British always before the war used to call him Herr Hitler. I would say, Herr Hitler, what was the primary war aims of the Third Reich? You could bet your last dollar that Hitler would say, we wanted to make Europe Judenrein clean of Jews. For the Nazis, the murder of Jews took precedence over almost everything else. I bring you to the summer of 1944, late spring, early summer of 44. The Red Army is coming from the east, and we have invaded Normandy on June 6th of 1944. Germany is being squeezed, and yet the Germans will allocate hundreds upon hundreds of trains to bring 436,600 Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz where the overwhelming majority are going to be gassed and cremated. The Germans will make sweep after sweep in the forests and the marshes to get the Jews. Even when it is counterproductive to the German war effort, the murder of Jews will take place. What's the asymmetry? The problem is not that the whole world hated the Jews. The problem is that for those who were sympathetic to the Jews, saving Jews never came high on a hierarchical list of what had to be done. In our own country, the issue is the depression, winning the war as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible, in terms of the loss of manpower. That's the issue. Very few people make the saving of Jews a top priority. It is only when the Jews, when saving Jews becomes a top priority, when people are willing to show the same tenacity, the same skill in saving Jews that the Germans are demonstrating in murdering Jews, that large numbers of Jews will be saved. The best example is Raoul Wallenberg in Budapest. Wallenberg lies, bribes, cheats, threatens, and may save as many as 100,000 Jews. Irina Updike, a young Polish woman, will become a prostitute for a German officer 
in order to save Jews, 12 Jews, who were living in the basement of that German officer commandant's house. Irina Sendler will risk it all in order to save Jews. It is only when you have people like that that large numbers of Jews can be saved. And the silence, the silence of religious leaders who have other concerns, the silence of an American president, a British prime minister, who also have other concerns. It's not that the whole world hated the Jews. It's that those who wanted to save them very rarely made saving the Jews a top priority. What are we to learn from this? Again, I don't have a monopoly of the Jews. I really don't. I'll give you lesson number one that I have determined. Racism, religious hatred, hatred based upon abhorrent for the different is an abomination. Whether it is hatred of gays and lesbians, of African Americans, of Latinos, of Jews, of Christians. Here I am lecturing to you on the Holocaust. And I myself am Jewish. I am telling you that the most persecuted people in the world at the present time are not Jews. Although Jews have been killed in France, they've been harassed in Sweden and Denmark and Norway and a whole host of places. It's Coptic churches in Egypt that have been destroyed. It's Christians in Pakistan that have been destroyed. It's Christians in Nigeria that have been killed. Whatever the discrimination is, it must be rejected. There is no place for hate. Hate is. Hate paves the road to Auschwitz. And then there is something else that has to be said. It is a difficult question. How do you resist evil when there is a price to pay? As I tell my students at Union, you didn't like the second President Bush. You set up a, a table in the student center and you got a petition. You don't like President Obama, you put up another table and you set up a petition. Will you lose your fellow, your scholarship? Will the professor give you a bad grade? Will you be thrown out of school? The answer, of course, is no. In the period of the Holocaust, in the period just prior to the Holocaust, it was essential for people to get up and speak out, even when there was a risk that accrued to themselves. The old statement that we learned in high school, I'll paraphrase it, Edmund Burke's statement, the only thing for evil to triumph is when good men and women say nothing. It, but that is not, again, by the grace of God, we live in this wonderful country. So if we protest, nothing's going to happen to us. But on a personal level, I must tell you, what is necessary to keep in mind is when you hear an off-color, dirty joke, and not sometimes dirty and not sometimes off-color, against a group of people. It's not enough to frown. It's not enough not to participate. You have to stand up and say it's damn wrong that words like dyke and faggot and kike and spick and wop and nigger and chink, they have no place in our language. And it is not enough simply to keep your mouth shut. You've got to stand up and resist evil. That's a lesson of the Holocaust. And there is a third lesson. There may be many more. If you want to ask me questions, or you want to debate me, that's fine. Look at again, look at me well. Would you believe, 50 years ago and 50 pounds ago, <laughs> Professor Burke was a jock. I was good. I played basketball, I ran to show you my age, I used to run the 440, now it's the 400 meter, a terrible race, he's got to sprint the whole way. I was fairly good. I love athletics. I love it. I watch all the games, baseball, basketball, football, I watch them all. Great athletes are not heroes. Great entertainers are not heroes. They're very good at what they do, and they deserve what they get. They have trained their entire lives in many cases. But they are not heroes, and what they are doing is not heroism. 
You study the Second World War, and you study the Holocaust, then you get an understanding of what heroism is. For the war, again, I bring you back. Whether it was at Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Saipan, Iwo Jima, or Akinawa, or whether it's at Omaha Beach on the morning of June 6th or 44, the Higgins boats takes the soldiers, nor the Marines. They take them to the beach. And the sergeant says, 30 seconds, and the ramp goes down. And you see the German or the Japanese artillery fall in the water. Or you hear the ping, ping, ping of machine gun bullets off the side. And when that ramp goes down, you charge into that fight. That's heroism. Or, you have a list of names out there. I gave you some names. Irina Sedler, Irina Updike, Pastor Trotme, a whole group of Catholic priests, ordinary people. Those people risk their lives to save Jews. In Eastern Europe, the penalty for sheltering a Jewish man, woman, and child is death for you and death for your family. And yet thousands of people will do it, and thousands are going to die. Those people were heroes and heroines. They risked it all. Now, it is a matter of debate among historians as to why they did it. They did, some of them do it for religious reasons? The answer is yes. Amber has told you about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. There were other people. It's the Christian thing to do. You don't allow this to happen. <coughs> Archbishop Selege stands on the altar in Toulouse and says that what the Vichy government and what the Nazis are doing to the Jews is wrong and the Christian thing to do is to save the Jews. Is it left-wing politics? Are people caught up? The Jews are our working class brothers and sisters. They must be saved. Is that it? Or is it ordinary decency? You can't let people be treated like that and you gotta somehow come to their assistance. I cannot give you an answer. There are some things in history and politics that are more within the realm of the psychoanalyst than they are of the historian. All I can tell you was there should have been more of them, but there were thousands upon thousands that risked their lives to save Jews, and thousands paid the price. Those people were heroes and heroines. And there is another group. Perhaps some of them are in the audience. These are the Holocaust survivors. These are the people that saw things that no human being should ever see. These are the people that experienced things that no human being should ever experience. And some of them, not all of them, not all of them, the Holocaust survivors that you see are the ones, for want of a better euphemism, have put it together. But there are many in mental institutions. There are many that have not been able to put it together. But for those who put it together, <laughs> forgive the colloquialism, for those who married again, who raised new families, became contributing citizens to the countries in which they are in, to which they came to, these too are heroes and heroines and they should be a model for us all. There are not too many young people here. If there are any, let me address myself to them. For those of you that are older than the age of 30, you're gonna find what I say very trite. But for young people, it is important. The very last thing that I tell my students in the Holocaust class at Union, I tell them, I don't care. I tell them that life is beautiful. Life is good grab on it. But I tell them, I don't care how smart you are, how pretty you are, or how handsome you are. Nobody gets through this life without taking a hit. Everybody gets hurt sooner or later. The trick is to come off the floor. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. What I tell my students, and if there are any young people here, when life becomes a little bit more difficult than it should be, draw strength from wherever you can get your strength, and draw strength from those heroes and heroines of the Holocaust. For they experience things that by the grace of God, you will never experience. And so what I say, what do I say to you? 
I say to you, study the Holocaust well because we know it has already happened after 1945. In Rwanda, in Cambodia, it may happen again. Study the Holocaust. Learn how to see when it's coming. Learn how to prevent it. Learn how to deal with it when it reels its, reels its ugly face. It could be a tough century. And so I end with the ancient Jewish charge. The charge that Joshua gave to the people as they crossed the Jordan. Whether you are a Christian Jew or Muslim, the charge is applicable. Hamatz be strong, be resolute, and be of good courage.